Awesome. Yeah, so I'm 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 good on the recording. It's going it's going fine. And uh go All right, on. here we go. Uh for the radio audience, please tell us who you are, where you are, and what you do. What up? I'm I, that's A H I in all capitals. I'm in Toronto, Ontario, Canada right now. I'm a singer-songwriter, uh recording artist, touring artist, and uh just released my new record Prospect in November. Yeah, it's a really beautiful, intense listen. Like, I, I really <laughs> try to get people to listen to records like we used to, maybe start to finish, if right. possible, right? Because a lot of us, I think, I think as we grow older, we forget how to really listen to music as an art form, not just like background music while you're chopping Cooking. vegetables for dinner, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> It's like, no, you go and see a movie, you sit there, you turn off your phone, you like concentrate, you go to a museum, you like witness the paintings in this huge hall, right? And yes, live music, I think, lets us really uh, experience music up close, but you know, you're drinking, you're talking to your friends. Right. Um, and I think like music oftentimes doesn't get appreciated as a art form, like living poetry. Really, right, right, right. you know, yeah. like you go to a poetry reading, which I don't know, maybe some people still do that. <laughs> You're like appreciating the words like like each line. Right. 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 Yep. I used to do and, poetry. you know, you open this record with that title track prospect. Right. And we're immediately brought into your family history, your right. story. Right. There's no like holding back. Right. We're talking about your grandfather who you never met. Right. And no matter what you do, that DNA is rolling within you all the time. Right. Your family history, um, all the sins and all the glory of people right. you've never met deep within you. Right. Um, why did you want to lead with that? If it's the story of the record, like, Everything I do is about relationship. Everything I everything I write is about relationship. And I got into music because it's easy to write a love song and be like, I'm heartbroken and you know, here's here's the love of my life. And I do that too. Um, but the relationship songs that I find most fascinating deal with the everyday life. You know what I mean? Right. The things we don't talk about, the things that don't get up get on the top pop charts. You know what I mean? Right. And that that song has my favorite lyric on the record. And I said, look. Just give it to them. If if the audience can get through this song, uh-huh. <laughs> you know what I mean. And it's it's not like that hard to get through. But if they can get, if they receive this song, then they're just gonna be coasting through the rest of this record. And it just felt like when we when we did it, Paul Mayberry, who was the producer of the record, amazing guy. Um, and we we intentionally went in to say we want to make this a record from beginning to end to have that kind of classic record vibe. Right. Um, one record I was listening to a lot when I we were recording when I was in Nashville, um, Lovers Rock, Sade. Okay. And if you listen to that record from beginning to end, like if it has that same feeling and there's some heavy content on that that record, right? So I think Prospect, it's just kind of like that song emerged as the title track. It emerged as my story and it kind of sets the precedent for everything else I'm talking about in the in the record. Not directly, but indirectly, even like a song like Danger is the next song. Um, the way that song came about, I won't go into that yet, but the way that song came about and the story about the mother losing her child, in an indirect way, it's Prospect is speaking about that legacy. You know what I mean? The loss of right. that legacy before it had opportunity to, you know, to carry on its own life to its fullest, right? So, yeah, Prospect was just like, it's, it's a, it has a dope groove on it. You know what I mean? Mus musically, Dwan Hill played on the keys and just like slayed that song. So I felt like musically it, it fit and, you know, it has an epic intro. But then story-wise, it's like this is this is me. This is you're gonna hear me on this record. You know, here you go. Well, that line, I want to live like someone before my time is counting on me. Right? <laughs> it has to like you have to kind of bend your brain a little bit to think about <laughs> almost the time travel vibe of that. Right? It's like the past and the future, the present, as we learn from science, are kind of all interconnected, whether we right. feel like it is or not. You right. know, um, 
the decisions and the pain that our grandparents went through. Um, I just lost my grandmother uh, 93 uh, a couple weeks ago. And, oh, wow. Sorry to hear that, man. You know, she lived an amazing life. Right. And you only realize when you think about it deeper, like the insecurities that she had, that she had to deal with growing up through the Great Depression, losing mm -hmm. her father when she was three years old, you mm -hmm. know, like that's somewhere in the back of my bloodstream, right? It's, it's you know, it's, it's like it's, that, it's, that fear that everything could be taken away, right? That back then it was like, you didn't have penicillin, your dad got pneumonia, it was game over, game you know? Over. Right, right. And now we're seeing people now. How is the fair of- Lost in a know. different way, but it, it's like history is connected. There's there's different sicknesses and waves of of uh, renewal that go through our societies. Trauma, you know? trauma is another thing that we pass on. You know what I mean? But then, you know, it's, it's there's the positive stuff we pass on. You know what I mean? Right. So like, there's this thing, one, one of the, the inspirations for that song, this is very like heady, maybe a little bit, but the monarch butterfly, you know what I mean? Starts from North America uh -huh. and they travel all the way to South America, lay their eggs or their right. larva, whatever you want to call it. Right. <laughs> right. And then they die in South America. But when the larva hatches into a butterfly, they know the pathway right. all the way back to North America. It's just coded in them. You know what I mean? It's right. like, so I looked at life like another, on the other side of that, my father, smoke in you know in the 80s smoking was like everywhere right right um father smoked my wife's father smoked in the house she has allergies i have allergies yeah. i don't smoke my wife doesn't smoke now my son has like super allergies yeah right so we pass that stuff on don't my dad my if my dad met my son when he was smoking my son said hey you're gonna give me like severe chronic allergies and asthma Right. Can you stop? Would he be like, nah, fuck you, man. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep doing this. He might be like, you know what? You're my grandchild. For you, I'll do that. You know what I mean? So I look at it, is can we hack our this is this is like heady stuff, but like, can we hack our DNA in yeah. a way where not necessarily like going in and doing sequencing, but just by our actions, right. by how we think, by what we do, by what we pass on to our children, how we raise our children, how we interact with each other how we face our trauma, can we hack ourselves so that we produce better offspring? You know what I mean? Like, right. and that's kind of what, and then on top of that, can we acknowledge like our history, our ancestry, our, the heritage we come from? How does that affect how we think about the world, how we view about the world, how we look at our, our place in the world? Right. It's okay, based off of that, how am I gonna, what am I gonna give to my, the next generation? Whether it's your children adopted or whatever it is, like what am I gonna pass on to that next generation? So Prospect, this whole record is kind of about legacy. It's kind of about stamping yourselves in time and saying I'm here to, to make sure my life is counted, to make sure my purpose is fulfilled, whatever that may be, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, I try to make the, the idea really simple because like when you go into it, it's a, you can have a philosophical conversation about it for hours, you know? But um, Prospect the Song is my way of taking that big complex idea about our purpose in life, our, our place in this life, and making it as simple as possible. So let's go back. Uh, you're from Canada, from Ontario. And mm. um, did you grow up in kind of a small town? Brampton is like a suburb of, of Toronto. It's about 30 okay. minutes outside of Toronto. Um, it was a suburb when I was born. Now it's, it's, it's less, less like that. But yeah, it was very like communal in terms of like children, very multicultural. I think in the, I'm the youngest of four siblings. Okay. Um, and it was like every race was in our childhood group of friends. Like, you know, like right. every race, every religion. And we just all hung out and like parents nowhere to be found. Like I was, and since I was the youngest, I was probably out there a lot younger than the other children because my brothers right. were with me. But uh, yeah, that was, that's how I grew up. Very multicultural, very like just, we were out there just doing our stuff. It's funny. So you had four siblings and now you have four kids, right? Exactly. And this is, and this is the crazy thing. My parents had girl, boy, boy, boy. My wife and I have girl, boy, boy, boy. Exact same wow. thing. What, is, what are the probability of that? Like what's the actual chance of that? <laughs> right? Do you see your kids like aligning with the order of your siblings or are they just totally different people? I, I have to wait a little bit, but in my I don't know if it's like I'm imposing that on them. But yeah. the, the trippiest thing is, my youngest 
son is a spitting image, splitting image, spitting image, what is it? Splitting image of me. Like if you look at my baby picture and his baby picture, yeah. exact same. Like we're twins. So, right. um, it, yeah, and it's, it, there's also probably like, just where you're born in the in the hierarchy of a family, you might just take on characteristics, just yeah. based off of, I'm the middle child and I'm gonna be ignored, or I'm the I'm the first boy, so I'm gonna act like you know. I was reading something about how, the oldest child will try to be more discipline disciplinary and try to like, please the parents more because they grew up with just the parents, and then the next yeah. child is gonna be a little bit more like comical. Not always, but like they're gonna try to be more comical. They're gonna try to break the rules a little bit because yeah they're trying to get attention in different ways than the oldest child trying to get attention. You know, it's so there's, there are like statistics. I think that like, if you're born at a certain place in your family, depending on how much years are between you, you're going to take on certain characteristics just because of the dynamic of that family. So I think, yeah, there's definitely attributes I see, but I don't know how much of it's me imposing it on them or if it's yeah. just, it's actual, like I see you in this person. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. I, I found that, old school video of you singing the Bob Marley tune with your little <laughs> oh daughter, God. you know, and it's just a great juxtaposition because look, we've seen these cover videos so many times where it's like, look, I'm, I'm going to sing with my kid and it's going to be like adorable and maybe I'll get a thousand views, but like your voice is so like emotional in it. And so like in it, right. Cause you know, like by you singing it, that Bob Marley is like more than just, music for you right Not it's like really. a prophet right? right it's like Absolutely. it's like this guiding light so you're going full force and then your daughter's sort of like yeah i'm just gonna mild the words and <laughs> another song my dad's singing on this yeah she too. wasn't yeah. she wasn't even supposed to be in that video she yeah. was like we were in we we're in london england oxford circus um i think we just did a day. i don't even know what we were doing that day but we found this like corner and we, we sat on the stoop and I was doing like, I did like at least five takes. And every time I was doing takes, she was ruining my takes, right? Yeah. So finally, I'm like, yo, my voice is like raspy as heck right now. Like I gotta, if I don't get this one, I don't think I could do another one. And right. I'm like, just let her in it. Just let her sit in this in the video <laughs> with me. And then, and then that was that. And the, the craziest part about that, Rita Marley like actually emailed me, right? And it wasn't, a, it was literally Rita Marley. Um, I mean, her team sent a yeah. message <laughs> from Rita Marley. Uh, and yeah, Bob Marley's like, if I only had to have one musician in my life, um, music in my life, albums is Bo all Bob Marley and the Whalers. Like I can live off of that for the rest of my life. So, I think like, I mean, maybe it's silly to say, but I feel like his value as a songwriter is not appreciated. No, like not, not the dude's all. got pop hits for days, right? right? I mean, he's got hooks and choruses that like are just part of the universe almost like the Beatles or the Stones right mm -hmm. like no woman no cry like you could hear that in any country in the world and everyone would sing along right, 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 right. it just like is part of the universe at this point no um, one love redemption song right and I think it's because he's from a different like when we make these lists they're usually like like regional lists like it's usually like this country is right. making the list but he's from Jamaica, so it's like it's not like the jamaican list ever gets worldwide <laughs> notoriety because he's number right. one on every west indian like caribbean list that you would think yeah. of you know what i mean um maybe you go to germany and like he's number one on the german list you go to africa he might be number one on the so like it's just a product of how we make these lists in the world you know what i mean um bob marley's like one of the greatest songwriters ever right and and, and not just him but like his camp because a lot of those people right. He wasn't the only one writing songs, you know what I mean? So, but you didn't come from a musical family. You didn't have sort of any leg nah. up in the music industry, and you started pretty late, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I was probably on my way to become a professor or a, or a priest or something like <laughs> a philosopher or something. Uh, no, like you know, my father's Trinidadian, mother's Jamaican, and music is not necessarily either you're full in it or you're, it's not even an option. You know what I mean? Go to school, get yeah. an education uh, as immigrants as well to Canada. And, you know, but we love music growing up. Me and my siblings would do like, like um, talent shows and videotape ourselves doing talent shows. And I love singing, but Bob Marley was the reason why I got into it. I was just like, if the music, what I was going through in my life at that time and the thing, the questions I had about life and, and what I wanted to do with my life, Bob Marley was answering a lot of those questions. Yeah. And I said, why isn't there music like this? Why isn't there music that dives into just like 
lift, uplifting your emotions, uplifting your heart in the way Bob was. So I said, I'll, I'll make that music. Um, but yeah, man, I dropped out of school. I was at York University. I dropped out. Wasn't too happy. My mom's a teacher. My dad was a teacher. Sister's a teacher. Godparents. Godfather's a principal. Godmother is a lawyer. Brother's a lawyer. Like, so that was where I was supposed to be going down, right? And I'm the artsy fartsy youngest one. I was like, nah, I'm leaving school. I'm going to go backpack and I'll be back. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I became a musician and, you know, like, yeah, so when you say no leg up, it's just been me and my wife grinding and just trying to make sense of it and then just trying to become a better musician and, and, and just create better stories and find a way to, my biggest goal is to just make sure that I'm creating something that's going to help people get through certain things in their life. You know what I mean? Just to, to right. uh, it's, it's important to me that the songs I write help me through life. And if they help me through life, I feel like there's somebody out there that it's going to help them through life, right? It's, it's therapeutic. It's, it's like spiritual for me. So, Well, that song, uh, Say It To Me, feels like an updated Lean On Me, you know, Bill Withers, uh, and something that like is like a companion for people in need, right? right. Um, and when you come back from these travels, right, um, do you find that you still have that restlessness within you or do you feel like no i i've learned so much and i need to like make my home here and spread the word from here you always i think the restlessness is is if as an artist you know what i mean i know you know this that that restlessness is also part of your creative like yeah. process you know what i mean so i don't think the restlessness will ever go because you're always striving to to outdo yourself and just to make better art more pure art Right. But I feel like every time I've done those travels, I've come back with a with a part of myself I didn't know was there. Right. And, a, and a, like so, for example, like I backpacked across Ethiopia for about a month and that experience taught me that I don't I don't think I want to live anywhere else in the world than Canada. You know what I mean? Um, and not to say Canada is, the, you know, I'm sure a lot of people listening are going to be from the U.S. Um, there's something about Canada for me, Toronto, that made me realize like this is where i want to raise i lived in england for a while like just raising a family here and i don't know if it's better for my career or not like maybe if i was just right up in nashville where my whole team is things would skyrocket you know what i mean but I, the family is important to me so there's there's something about canada that can't be compared i don't know if it's the best country in the world but for me it made sense um one of the things so i backpacked across trinidad um, and the, I always come back with these morals or these messages. And as you said, like one of the things I learned was stay put, you know what I mean? That was mm -hmm. like a message that kept resonating with that I kept hearing, stay put, stay put, stay put. Cause you're looking for something and what you're looking for is always inside of you, uh -huh. right? Backpacked across Canada, same message, stay put, stay put. Cause you, we, we, I don't know if you're like a soul searching person like, like that. Cause some of us are, some of us aren't, um, but we're often, you don't even have to be a soul searcher. Like, just look at like, it's the year end charts, year end Spotify wrapped. And no matter how much better your wrapped was, like your numbers were as an artist than last year, you're always looking at other artists who have better numbers than you and say, oh, how did they get those numbers? Are they, you know what I mean? I'm at 20 million, but these people are at 40 million. What playlist did they get on that I didn't get on? Um, so for me, stay put at that point was just like, appreciate what you're doing, man. Like, appreciate that you have yeah. life. I appreciate you going forward and stop always looking for other stuff. You know what I mean? Like you have everything you need and, and go forward with that. Right. So yeah. Go well, ahead. I think the message for me, the message of this record is um, acceptance and um, the realization that you can keep searching and love where you are and love the people around right. you and not have to always be escaping right. because I think as travelers, as artists, like you said, there's a reason why that agitation is going on in our brains to create these little pearls of songs, right? If we were satisfied, if we weren't restless, we it's wouldn't need to create. There's no, there's right. no need, right? We could just like wake up, have breakfast and that's enough, you know? Yeah but we have to do this other thing 
it's a calling, it's a gift, it's a curse sometimes, right? Mm. Because I find that as I'm about to have my first child, oh, and by wow. me, I mean yeah. my wife is about to have the child yeah. um, in January. Um, and I wish we were in Canada, to be real. Um, <laughs> we're talking about that. No we family wife, leave here. Anyway, um, <laughs> I find that I'm ashamed that I have not created more stability for mm. this little being, right? Right, right, right? That like this wandering life that I've created, which honestly, like I'm proud of, of the music and the, the art that I've created and that it's sustained me to a point, but like, it's hard to not compare yourself with people who are like really making it right. Or right. like have the house with the yard and the pool. Right. And the nice car and the vacation cabin. And you're like, Oh, that would be great for my little one. Cause now it's not about me. It's right. About, we but have, I think we'd have, I think we, I think artistic creative people make cooler parents sometimes too, though, you know? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. It's like, we can bring that little creature into this really cool world um, and say like, look, you can be whatever you want to be. Freedom, right? You could be a doctor, a scientist. You don't have to like <laughs> write songs and, and play music festivals like me. But this is another world that exists. That's my, my parents, I think, to their credit, never questioned my path. They're just like, yeah, really? obviously. Go ahead, you know. Opposite for me, yo. <laughs> my right, mom. But I think so, maybe they should have. Yeah. No. Right, 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 right. <laughs> my mom was supportive in everything I did. My dad's like very strict, and like sometimes with the whole prospecting too. Sometimes we we measure other people's lives based off of our failures. Right. You can't do that because I failed at that, or whatever it is. Like my dad was a musician, but whatever he did, right? So, yeah, man. Like we're living in a time where I don't think we understand how much i don't know if this is a, pro, a proper term but comparison comparison anxiety we're dealing with i think in the, this is the highest in human yeah. history oh, there's yeah. no okay. way we could be we could see this many people's lives and then not only on top of that is everybody most people not everybody are, are faking it yeah. are, are curating and designing what they want us to see right right so you, that's the you know, me and my wife talk about this thing all the time like this like are we not doing enough? You know what I mean? But then you got to compare yourself to where you were 10 years ago. Right. You know what I mean? Like when my first child was born, we were, we were in a bachelor apartment, one futon bed. Now we're in a whole house. You know what I mean? Like that in itself is something to applaud. Maybe you don't have the mansion. Maybe you don't have the, the, you know, the, the investment account that, that you want or the, the amount that you want invested, but whatever it is. But it's it's crazy that I think that's something that's going to be studied about how much we're right. forced to compare ourselves to others, and we're going to see that it's going to have some some effects on our, our mental health um, in ways that we can't know yet. You know, when you put a song like uh, "Coldest Fire" into the world, right? Um, you can feel that sort of helplessness. That you know, am I doing enough? Am I saying enough? Right? right. And you're witnessing something like the George Floyd. Uh, murder right and right. as a person of color it's like look this has happened so many times right why is this going to be the thing that changes everything right, right. how do i know that i'm not going to be part of some next part of this crazy shit you know it's like we'll never understand right there's no way uh folks like me will understand but I think we marched in the street in 2020 right. as a way to being like, look, this is a moment where we can actually say something collectively as a human race, right? right. As people that want real change. Now, it's not going to happen overnight, but I think seeing how police departments in different cities are forced to deal with mental health forced right. to deal with poverty and uh, neighborhoods as a way of um, seeing their cities um, and how much they've been segregated and how much they've been uh, isolated. Right. As something like, look, this is all of our problem. Right. right? right. How did that song uh, 
start coming into your brain. Yeah, well, the George Floyd incident brought certain black individuals that I know personally to speak up about things that I've never heard them speak up about before. And not because right. they weren't for the cause. Or the, it's just like it did something to our psyche and our souls that I don't think anybody really understand. Um, and I remember making a post and this lady said to me, so I toured south, the south, southern, southern states to a very strong Christian audience. And one of the fans, I had, a lot of fans came from that group. You know, I, mean? I, I, I don't, I, I'm not in the Christian music scene. It's just that I happened to tour with Lauren Daigle. She's an amazing okay. artist. Uh, we're on tour for like two years, so I built a following there. Wow. Um, so while I am a Christian, I make I make folk singer songwriter music. That's how I, I look at it, right? So this lady said to me, "We should pray for George." What did she say? We should pray for for Derek Chauvin, right? Let's pray for the police officer, right? She said that to huh. me on my on my post, right? That's nice. And I and I, I had this long response that I want to say my wife was like my wife who's also my manager she was like I don't think you should say that I think you should yeah. just, just, just leave it alone and I was like look when I respond to my fans I respond to them for everything like so I say that when they say something good I respond to them when they say something bad I respond to them I, I, I respond to every one of my fans so why would I just ignore this right, right. and it kind of like I said you got to support me on this you know what I mean you got to be with me on this because I feel like something needed to be said here so I, I wrote her yeah. a, a long response and she apologized she's like I didn't mean it like that and what I just ultimately I said to her I was like I'll pray for the cops who are in the industry trying to figure out what to do what's right or wrong I'll pray for George for his family but like Derek Chauvin whatever his situation that's between him and God like like I, yeah. I have nothing to do with, like I, I don't need to pray for him right now you know what I mean? And it's t right. even if I wanted to, like, why are we even saying that? You know what I mean? Like, there's so many people hurt from this that I'm going to pray for the guy who murdered someone. You know what I mean? Like, I get it. But it's like, I'm Christian, but I, I have certain lines of yeah. <laughs> where I can draw, right? So what I realized at that point is, like, I'm in this weird space. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of my heritage. I'm very so aware of my social place in life. But I also have this strong fan base of Christians some of them evangelical who will say blue line or will say things that I'm like, eh, yeah. you know, like, or will take my words and use them to kind of have a kumbaya moment, yeah. right? To say, you know, so the post I made was literally, do you remember that? That I think the guy was from Minnesota or, or Detroit, where it was a sergeant who was like, gave daps to a, a black guy, a police sergeant, and like, it went, the picture went viral. Uh -huh. Like he, he gave pound to him, picture went viral. There's a whole video, and he came out. Um, it was, I think, it was a mayor or a sergeant, and like they were hugging. So I said, the more yeah, of this yeah. we'll see with with police interacting with the community, the less of this we'll see, and it's Derek Chauvin on George Floyd's neck, right? Okay. And some people are using that as an excuse for me to say, like, I don't know how they took it, but I felt like I was being used as a scapegoat for like something, you know, like like oh we. As, if we love the cops, then we'll all be fine. You know what I mean? Like if we treat yeah. we treat cops good, then and it's like nah, that's not what I'm trying to say. So I was just, I, it came to a point where I was like, obviously my life matters. Obviously, right. I want to see more equality for my people. Um, but if I say something, people are gonna take my words and skew it one way. Are they gonna they're gonna turn against me if I don't say something? Then am I am I being a hypocrite? So the, the, it came from this idea that. I don't want to be in this BLM war or this blue line war. Like for me, it comes down to one simple thing, humanity. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yes, my life matters. I'm not going to beg you to, to acknowledge that. I don't yeah. come from that background. I understand it matters. I'm going to keep plowing forward like it matters. And whether you acknowledge that or not, whether I can get you to say black lives matter or not, I'm going to live like I have worth in this life. You know, yeah. what, you know what I'm saying? Um, and it just, it was just, it was like, in that moment, I was just like, I gotta say something, and I said it. And I don't know if it, you know, I don't know if it means anything. She came back and apologized. At least she didn't double down and try to argue. That's huge. And she was like, I love your music. I just want to know you know I'm a huge fan, and like I, you know, I just want to let you know because this might be controversial, and I don't, you know, I've been alienating Lauren Daigle fans for a while because of things I'm saying. But as Christians, we can't use our faith as an excuse to not look at the social issues in life. You know what I mean? Like, right. 
as a Christian, you're, you should be kind of anti-establishment. You shouldn't be pro-establishment. As a Christian, you should be not against the law, but you're not like, it, it's, I don't, I don't want to get into too much of the religious side of it, but I feel like now more than ever, I kind of have to speak on it, but it's right. like Christians use Christianity often as a, as a, as a barrier from uh -huh. in reality. And it's like, yo, if you just look at the Bible, Christ was killed by the government. Yeah. That's what it came down to. You know what I'm saying? So for us to be like pro government and pro establishment and just kind of like hiding behind these institutions and saying slavery didn't, didn't matter. Um, racism doesn't exist. All cops are good. Like it's not yeah. even in, in accordance with what what's in the Bible. You know what I mean? Like, right. So, it, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't speak about it a lot because I just, I think it's such a touchy subject, yeah. but I'm learning more and more that like my voice in this conversation matters. You know what I mean? So the, the, the line on coldest fire is I'll be damned if I do damned if I don't, but I won't be damned at all. So I'm just going to kind of say what I want to say. Um, yeah. And maybe it will, maybe it will enlighten some Christians and make them speak up on certain things that they're afraid to because they're in a, an institution that's telling them this is our political stance. You know what I mean? Um, as a Christian, you shouldn't have a political stance. You know what I mean? We don't, it's not a, in my opinion, at least. Um, anyhow, that's my. <laughs> well, it's one thing, I think it's one thing to start speaking your mind <laughs> about some pretty intense American subjects. Right. I mean, they're global subjects, but I think a lot of this is very deeply rooted in Americans, <laughs> America's unique uh, racist past. Right. And, um, you know, the police force was created as basically a slave uh, vigilante catching operation. I mean, that's like right. how the police force in most cities and, and, and states were created. Right. And you can see the legacy of that. Right. right. You could see this history that keeps unfolding. Right. I mean, the Civil War sounds like. Like we assume the civil war was so long ago, it's right? Like, you know, <laughs> our great grandparents like knew people who fought in that. Right, absolutely, you know? absolutely. Right. It's like that's right. not that long ago. Um, but if you go back to your first released indie soul, right? You have a song called "Older Than Us," right? Oh, you, you, Why well, you went back? <laughs> go way back to what 2016 or so? Yeah, right? wow. It's like you were saying some shit way before people knew who you were, right? And right. you have that line, you know when truth becomes treason, war becomes a playground, you know, where did it all begin? Like, who, like how deep in us is this, you know, right. Maybe it goes all the way back. You know, I'm, I'm very impressed with, with you. When I wrote those lyrics, um, I was so, I, I don't know how the song production wise sounds or like sonically melodically, good. but the, 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 the idea. So that song was inspired by um, Eric Snowden. Mm -hmm. Is it Eric Snowden? No, is it? Uh, no, it's something Snow Snowden. You know what I'm talking about, though. I think yeah. Um, and I was just watching a lot of his interviews. I, I, I'm a huge fan of that guy. I don't know if he's real or not, or what is his is his background. Edward Snowden. Edward Eric Snowden. You know who Eric Snow is? Is a basketball player. They used to play <laughs> yeah. with uh, Allen Iverson uh, <laughs> on the 76ers, and I always get them mixed up. Edward Snowden. I, I watch his stuff all the time, and um. But, you know, my older stuff was extremely political in a lot of this, and on that indie soul record, you know, there's a song called We All Know, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's it's literally talking about trickle down economics, you know what I mean? Right. And, and, you know, um, I don't, I don't separate my faith from social issues. Right. But I try to I tackle this stuff with humanity and not with politics. Because I think at the core of everything, and this is kind of going back to a prospect, is that we are living out traumas and legacies mm -hmm. from the past and holding on to these things. And sometimes the best thing to do is just start over, start with a clean slate. Right. You know, I'm wrong. You're wrong. Let's start over. Let's figure out. Let's figure out how to, to sort this out. One thing Dave Chappelle said. I'm a huge Dave Chappelle fan. And he's like, in South Africa, like everybody came to the table and just said what they did wrong, and said, and then kind of had a collective. Let's all forgive each other. So not to harp, harp on Christianity in the States, but like if we're a Christian, if it's, if it's supposed to be a Christian nation, which I don't know if that's a fact or not, 
then there has to be some authentic reconciliation and authentic coming to the table and saying, I apologize. Do you forgive me? And then how can I repay that debt? Uh -huh. Right? It's not just about, I apologize, forgive me. Let's continue with the legacies that we, we've inherited for generations upon generations. Yeah. Um, I am not optimistic about that changing because greed is, is, is more powerful than love and compassion, right? Not completely, but in this world it is. Um, it's more powerful overall, but not individually, on an right. individual level, right? So I don't, I don't see a lot changing economically or overall socially, but I think in, on an individual level, we can affect people's lives and talk to people on, on, a, on a, you know, I, 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 I know somebody who, FBI agent, no, CIA, sorry, he, you know, was on tour with this guy, CIA agent, um, very strong supporter of, he didn't like Obama, didn't, was, was a huge fan of Trump, and I, I don't care whether you like Obama or not, I don't, or if you're a fan of Trump or not, but we had conversations, and I was asking him stuff about, like, the world, and I said, you know, what do you think are some of the biggest threats that are coming to the world? And he was like, huh. um, like, um, digital, digital hacking and stuff like that, and he's also talking about not a virus, but like a biological thing that would spread across the world, right? This is before the pandemic. And he, one thing he said is like, I've seen the worst in humanity, uh -huh. like a father holding their own child at gunpoint, holding them hostage, ready to, you know, take, I don't know if this is for children, this podcast, but you know, I apologize. Definitely not. Okay. <laughs> you know, ready to kill their own child to get out of a situation execution i've seen this i've had to get go into countries and stop this stuff but then i've seen the highest level of compassion in humanity and, and overall i believe in humanity you know what i mean but at the same time political things we had strong differences about it and i looked at it like i could argue with you about politics forever but like do we have human similarities right do we have grounds on which we could have, find joy with each other you know what i mean um i never I don't care if you're racist and this is something maybe people will judge me for like i don't care if i know a racist person i'm not gonna be like, i can't talk to you because you're racist anymore because my question is why are you racist yeah. and are you really racist if you're willing to be my friend huh. because you can't make an exception for me because i'm uh -huh. as black as anybody else so the question is what it, it's not maybe that you're racist it's that you have certain prejudices that you don't understand yet because uh -huh. the moment you meet me and respect me and I break all those those tropes you have in your head, then you have to change your mind about that. And if you're not willing to, then you're stubbornly holding on to something that's not real anymore because you know me. You know what I mean? Um, I had a argument with my mother, who's a wonderful person, who's pretty liberal about pretty much everything, about unconscious bias. Right. And it didn't go well. She you know? <laughs> May I ask yeah. what, what, what she was unconsciously biased about? You don't put your mother out. You don't put your mother on blast. I don't want to. I don't want to you, get you in trouble. Right. No, I think it was about um, the idea that all of us as white people are looking at people around us and judging them. Right. And um, I mean, everyone judges everyone, but right. I think there's a unique lens in which we see the world, and there's at times things that people say the older generation, especially right now, that hurts to hear as the younger generation that is now saying like, this is no longer okay to say out loud, right? right. I'm not going to police your thoughts, but whatever you just said, I am not okay with, right? right. And <laughs> I don't think you meant to say this in a way that felt racist and weird, but I think that's part of what unconscious bias is, is that it's just, it's always there. And then sometimes right. it comes out and that is nothing that is the opposite of what, you know, a woman wants to hear from her son, you right. know, right, right. like, and that's just like one of those things that a lot of families are dealing with right now, you know, oh, man. don't, don't come to my house over uh, the holidays. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a lot of, argu a lot of arguments. The other side is that 
the same way we're looking at life right now and we're like judging ourselves amongst as musicians you know we talked about the spot uh, the spotify rap numbers and the right you know, like the house and the person who's, who's getting nominated for grammy right now that, and that we haven't been nominated for and it's amplified because of social media right so we're going to look at how that has affected our, our brains our neuroplasty in a couple in 10 years 20 years from now right uh-huh. when our parents were growing up they had television and I think it's hard for them to accept their hand in this implicit bias because they didn't themselves create the systems that program them to think like that. It's so, it's like, so there's a level of compassion that I think we need to have. Whereas I think in society now, we're just like, throw all these racists out. I hope they all die in this generation. The boomers, like, right. just let them die off. You know what I mean? They have a lot of information they can still obviously give us. They have experience that they can give us. I think there's just a way that we kind of have to like unlock an understanding that I don't know if I'm making sense, but like one, it's not their fault completely because they right. were like, there's videos of these, of, of our parents in bomb shelters waiting for Russia to bomb them. Like, you know what I mean? Like that, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? that was like put in their head, right? And we look at that now. We laugh at that stuff, right? I mean, but they were they they saw the TV. TV told them all cops were good. I don't think all cops are bad. I don't agree with that. I don't I don't like that sentiment. Um, they'd say that cops are heroes. Nothing's wrong. Listen to your teacher. Your teacher's never wrong. The authority is always right. And they they were programmed that way. You know what I mean? One argument I have with my mom is funny. It's not an argument, but like she's like. We raised you guys. We didn't do anything wrong. I was like, well, you know, yeah. they, like, they, they think they were perfect parents. And it's like, it's not that you're bad parents, it's that there's so much more information in the world that we realize certain things are not smart. Like certain things are just yeah. dumb. Like smoking around your children, maybe not smart. Um, having Coca-Cola for breakfast, I don't think we did that, but I, I've seen children do that. Maybe not smart. You know what I mean? Like, now we have more information. We can do things differently. We can educate our children differently. Um, I don't want to make excuses for racism. I don't want to ex- make excuses for, for stubbornness. Mm-hmm. But I think patience is something that even though our parents might not have it as much as we can, like we got this generation has to have it on the mere fact that the amount of information out today was not awarded to them right? Um, and afforded to them. So just because we because we have more information we just got to be more patient with them in in kind of like getting them to a place where they can understand maybe they're wrong about something you know what i mean the thing that the thing that confuses me the most about the refusal in this country especially but right. all over the world of where am i going with this the thing that confuses me about the gun violence issue right right, is that we do have the data right right we have all the information in front of us we see these we see these school shootings like what happened in michigan recently happen again and again with disgruntled confused young people but all sorts of different people who then reach for this tool of destruction that is readily available and then they take away people's lives, right. right? Who had nothing to do with their own inner turmoil. And yet, unlike smoking or um, certain drugs or, you know, even like poverty and racism, things that are in the world that we acknowledge, this is bad, we need to try to change it. We like double down in the opposite direction in this country right. with guns, right. <laughs> or we're giving people more ability to open carry and to just have guns in schools and in concerts and in churches like we're some sort of wild west like shootout gallery you know i mean i mean what i mean it is the wild west man that's like country western that's an american that's american culture right like you know as an outsider looking in um as a canadian we are the 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 loyalists. We call ourselves the loyalists. Like we are the we are the Commonwealth. So we didn't resist. You know what I mean? So when you see us, right. we say sorry, thank you. You know, okay, uh-huh. yes, um, we'll let you into our country. Can we? Can, so 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 one of the things we were talking about the other day, my wife and I, is how Canada allows U.S. musicians to come in without visas, uh-huh. and we we implemented this hoping 
that the U.S. would reciprocate that. Like, nope. Yeah. We're going to raise the price on visas, right? That's what's happened. So, U- U.S., they were the ones who rebelled against the Commonwealth, right? It's a right. no. We're fighting. And for better or worse, it, it awarded them their independence. It awarded them liberties, freedoms, and, and it, like, in- incredible amount of wealth, right? Uh-huh. I don't, th- so <laughs> I'm not saying it's okay, but I, I, to a slight degree, I understand the psyche of why people feel like they need to hold on to their guns. The problem is now, so Danger is a song I wrote on this record, right? right. You know, let's segue to the record. Um, and it's about a mother who lost her son to gun violence. When I wrote the song, I didn't think that the child died in the song, only until I found out that I, uh, so I, I, I'm gonna before I go into like what this how the song came about, I want to address the issue we just talked about. I'm tr- I think the biggest thing we have to do is we 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 always go after the political, and what happens when you go after the political, you get politics in the middle. Of, you get pol- politicians in the middle of it, and right. politicians are more concerned about their term, about how many people are going to vote for them, than they are about actually acting and getting things done. Execution, right? Right. What I think needs to happen in America in the world because there's gun violence in Toronto is, is, is crazy too. Right. Um, we got to get to the heart of the issue and the humanity of the issue. Right. I see so many people saying like online and this is social media. I don't know how many of those people are bots or how many are, are, are real accounts, but when something happened, when, when a person, like I saw a video the other day where a, a, a guy walks into a, like a computer store, sells like phones and computers and stuff like that. Yeah. He throws something on the table, which looks like a bag or a note. And I think he has a gun. And then the, the, the guy behind the desk, he's already ready with his hand on the side. You can see it. Guy walks over nonchalantly. The, the, it's a black guy who walks in. He, he walks over to the side of the store. Guy gets off his sheet and just unloads his clip on this guy. First shot, the, guy goes, the black guy goes down. Second two shots, hits his printer, mm-hmm. goes around the printer, and then just unloads the rest of the clip. And this was on Reddit. And the majority of the comments were like, good for him. Like he should. I'm glad he got to protect the store. If you saw this, he unloaded everything. And people are just saying, like, they teach us in, in school that you have to unload your clip because you don't want to even give the guy a chance to get back up. This guy wasn't getting back up after the first shot. It was obvious. Right. And people are, like, cheering like it's a movie. Right. Right? So I don't – maybe having the guns are the problem, but I think the psyche is the problem. I think right. the, the heart is the problem. You know what I mean? Um, the fact that we have to unload this clip on this person is just insane. The fact that there's so many situations where you see white males shooting at cops and then getting taken into custody and yeah. the black males just w- reaching for their wallet, yeah. getting shot. Like, you know, it's different states, it's different circumstances, different gun laws in each state, but still we see this time and time again. Um, so... so I try to avoid the political side of it and focus more on the, the heart. Like it's, it, I think it all comes down to the heart, how we, how we look at each other, how we value life. You know what I mean? And we're getting into a world more and more where we don't value life as much, you know? And it's, 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 I don't know if it's, I don't know what it is. I don't know what the cause of it is, but we got to address the heart. I think that's, that's like, it may sound cheesy, but you know, they always say guns don't shoot themselves. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and I, I want to flip that and say, well, well, why are we shooting? Why are the people doing it? Right. Okay, we got that. Guns don't shoot themselves. So let's let's leave that issue alone and ask, why are the people doing it then? And and, and address the people, right? Um. And yeah, that's, well, I think a, it's best in man. a weird in a weird way. It connects back to the comparison disease that we have. Right. right? It's like there's something deep within our animal brains that wants to always be a little bit better than our peers or the people below us. Right. And a way to keep certain groups of people slightly below us is to impose violence on them, to segregate them, to isolate them, make sure they can't have home ownership, that they can't uh, have businesses, that they can't travel freely and educate themselves. And, You know, you see it over and over again in these tests um, in school districts where they when they bring black Latino kids into these like bougie white schools and then Mm -hmm. they're like learning ability is like 
down here. And all of a sudden when they're in the school for like two months, they're literally the same, right? right it's right. like, you have to give the opportunities to everybody right. for you to say that your country allows the pursuit of happiness, right? right? Which is right, right. in our mantra, right? The pursuit of happiness. That means everybody's happiness, right? right? Bill Gates didn't just become Bill Gates. Somebody gave him a computer at a young age where yeah. he was able to take it apart, you know, like if, it, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But I think the thing that you do so well is, um, again, you go after the hard questions, right? But then I think <laughs> once we've talked about it, I think there's a lot of really great love songs and these <laughs> moments of softness, honestly, of like, hey, we have each other. That's enough. That's awesome, right? right. Um, I mean, the song that obviously, you know, kind of went viral and and a lot of people have heard Old Sweet Day off uh, We Made It Through the Wreckage. Right, right, right. Now, it's a sweet love song, but I think it also says, like, we've kind of come through this trauma together and we Absolutely. have each other. And that's, like, the most important thing, especially once you have a family. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that was I wrote that song in Nashville. It was the first song I wrote in Nashville. And I was, it, was, it was the first time I was away from my family for a longer period of time than a couple of days. You know what I mean? It was like a couple of weeks. Yeah. And that is, that is the essence of, what, of everything I write about. Like, we have each other and that's all we got in this life. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, and any song you hear on my record, on any of my records, I believe, there is a thread of relationship in it. It's not, the, you know, I don't think I've written a dance song. You know what I, mean? I don't think I've ever let's go party not all yet. Night. Not yet. Yeah, yeah. I tried to write it. It's just corny. It's like this is lame. It's about like dancing shoes and stuff. It's just, I just, but I might do that. You know what I mean? I'm not saying I wouldn't do that, but I, I feel like you have a limited time on this planet, um, and your message has to be succinct. Like if you're about getting money, about going to the club and dancing and having fun, that's beautiful. If you're about rocking out and just vibing, that's beautiful. That that's your your message. But for me family and and relationship and just me i've been in isolation before the pandemic like, like when i backpacked i wasn't with a group of people like it was just me by myself many nights in my own head you know what i mean trying to figure out okay what am i doing tomorrow where's my food coming from tomorrow you know what i mean um so yeah like there there's i just want to be with you when the darkness comes like the darkness is, is 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 the bad shit. You know what I mean? The things that you're right. fighting, you're you're afraid of. You know, just are we gonna get a house? Are we gonna be able to live in a, in a sustainable place? Like, you know, right now my wife and I are doing great, but like there was a time when we were like going to the Asian food market, buying a pack of avocados, hoping that one of them <laughs> were not totally disgusting. You know what I mean? Like, right. um, it, it. I think you're absolutely right when it comes down to just like we are all trying to find a way to live in this life. And unfortunately, when we get into this comparison thing, it, uh, it forces some people to push other people down so that they can feel that their life is more valid, valid, validated or that yeah. they have more in this life. And I think for me, it's just like, none of, that's, none of that matters. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, work for what you got, do it, work hard, whatever you get, you earn. But, the, like this pandemic, if it didn't show us anything, it's like all of that stuff can be taken away. You know what I mean? No matter yeah. what side of the fence you're on, you're on, if you think the pandemic was a big conspiracy, or if you think it was like created in a lab, or if you believe that like this is it, everything they told us is absolutely authentic and the pandemic just swept over the world, whatever you believe, it doesn't change the fact that the whole world shut down and that all this stuff can be taken away from them, that so many people lost lives during this yeah. pandemic you know what i mean that doesn't change and i think the saddest thing is we stop looking at each other in the eyes mm. and just speak with this with this political lens and I, you know i think more people are realizing that we can't do this anymore more people are speaking up um sarah silver just got in huge trouble for saying something i don't know what uh, silverman is it silver or sarah silverman silverman yeah silverman um i work with someone named sarah silver that's funny um Sarah Silverman, she got in trouble. I don't know what she said, but she made a comment. And I don't think she was trying to be racist or anything like that. 
um, she was just making a commentary. And I think more people are just like, you know, this, this political divide, this racial divide, like it's exhausting now. Yeah. It's nauseating. Like, can we stop? But there's too many people who have vested interests who built their, their, their livelihoods off of this stuff. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. I just want people to say, Hey, you and me, we're people, you know what I mean? I take a shit in the bathroom just like you take a shit in the bathroom. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I wash my hands just like you wash your hands. When I eat food, it goes into my mouth just like like we are not most of the things we do are very similar. Most of the things we do right. that bring us down to human levels, we can't change. You know what I mean? Like so there's a lot there's there's very few people, if any, on this life that just that do something that 99.999% of the population do. And they're just like, no, I do this completely differently. Like I just, I just, this is how I've, you know, I don't eat food. I just inhale oxygen and I'm fine. You know, there's, I don't know anybody like that. So the, the relationships, the family, the connections, the humanity, um, that's what matters most to me. And I hope more people can start looking at that because Yo, man, I don't know, like, I'm on outside, I don't like to talk politics, but it's it looks scary in your country, bro. Like, it, it, it's like, I don't know what's going to happen. Like, people talking about civil war, people talking about, like, the, the economy's going to crash, like, well, you know, like, who knows? You know, and it, it's, it's, people have been saying this forever, but, like, it feels like it's possible now. You know what I mean? Like, it feels like this could happen, you know, like. Well, I, I know, think, you... I think there's enough evidence to say it could go either way, right? Mm -hmm. But. I think when it comes down to it, there's always more good people than right. I want. I don't want to say bad people, but like the people who showed up to storm the Capitol, right? Now, there's Your plenty friends. of people who went. There you are. Yeah, there we are. Plenty of people who went January sixth to try to, uh, you know, end our democracy, right? right? But there was enough people. And I hate to say this, but like even a guy like Mike Pence, the vice right. president, Switch he there. refused to participate in this coup, right. Right? right? Right. Even some of these people high up in the Republican uh, Party were just like, this is even too much for us. Right. 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 Now, you could say like, well, that's just the beginning of something else. But I think the one thing. The one thing that I am proud of as an American is I think we know that democracy and this unique system that we've created that has these ideals, like right. everyone has the ability to pursue their own happiness, are worth saving, right? Right, right. right. Now, there's going to be a lot of resistance and the bent the bend towards autocracy is happening all over the world, not just here, right? right absolutely, yep. But the peaceful transfer of power has happened every election since 1776. You know, right. I mean, since, since uh, you know, George Washington, right? right? Which is insane, right? right? It's kind of like an unprecedented, impossible streak, right? It's very true, right. So the question is, will there be enough people to stand in the breach when the next storming of the Capitol happens? Try that right. I'm optimistic. I say yes. Yeah. Yeah. But um, just like throughout history, various plagues have, have decimated populations, but the people survived and thrived. Right. Yeah. Yep, yep. Like we, we've made it through. Right. Yes, um, yep. And there's a song called Full Circle on your record, which I love, of sort of like feeling like a misfit in your own skin, right? Feeling like nothing is ever right, except mm -hmm. when I can be with the person who loves me and appreciates me, right? It's like the wandering and the restlessness, that's always going to be within us, right? right? The doubt about our future, the doubt about um, our safety and our um, economic <laughs> stability. <laughs> right, but right. like when I'm with this person, that's like the most important thing about falling in love. It's like this person is like home base, right? It's like the one place I can be safe and believe in things, you know, 
And that's a beautiful, beautiful message. It's, oh man, I mean, you know, not to sound cheesy, but I have a, I have a, you know, my wife is like my muse, you know what I mean? Like every song I write yeah. is about her. She's also my manager, you know what I mean? She's you a know, lot of I, conflicts of interest there, you know? A lot, a lot. We had a great conversation last night about, <laughs> <laughs> about that. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I don't write anything that's not honest to me that I did like without her, I wouldn't be where I am in my career. You know what I mean? Um, and I feel like, you know, artists, we are like an interesting breed of people. Like if you can find someone that could like, I don't know what your situation is, but like a lot of artists don't have support from their spouse. Like they're, they're there. Yeah. But they're not there with rocking with them. Cause it's a hard right. thing to do. I go on tour. You got women like, DMing me, not like in a sexual way, but just like I love your music. You're so awesome. Your voice is so awesome. And you know, and I'm sure there's a few, a few, you know. I, I know we're interested. I'm, You're a good-looking fellow. I mean, let's be real. I'm right. <laughs> I'm pretty good at fending it off because, like, I go on stage and say, "My wife is my manager. This is my like talk about my children." So, like, I think people are, are like, "Okay, that'd be weird to like." You, you gotta, you gotta be careful. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> but my point is like a lot of wives or spouses, I won't just say wives, because if you're a female musician um, or whatever your circumstances, your spouse, your partner may not get it because they're not out there with yeah. you. You call them, oh man, it was a great show, but to have my wife, she gets it. She's right. rooting for me and she's like, I'll come back and like, she's like, how the show go? And I'm like, oh, it's cool. It's like, tell me more. Like She wants to hear because like she's living yeah. through it with me. Um, I don't know where I'd be, man. I don't know if, I don't know if you deal with apathy but like I deal with that a lot, like just kind of like, mm -hmm. um, what's the point of certain things? You know, I try to yeah. encourage myself, and she's 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 my motivation, she's my inspiration. So like, I I would I'd probably still be a wandering soul if I didn't meet her, and I don't know what I would do without her. And um, she keeps me grounded. Um, we we have a great family. We talked about the children earlier, and like th the way we raise our children, where our children respect us, the way they're very much a part of my career. When yeah. I signed my first deal, my children were there. When I signed my first booking agency deal, my children were there. You know what I mean? Like those things matter to me, and I and I and I hope that for you as well. You know what I mean? Like we like, I'm not trying to educate you or tell you anything because I have four children, so I like you know like I have a little bit of a head start on you. You should educate me. Okay, okay. <laughs> I would just say like, let your children see the process of what you're doing mm -hmm. as much as possible, so that they can respect it when you get older. I feel like a lot of people in the entertainment industry separate their jobs from their family, which is awesome. But I think letting your children see not just the creation of music, not just the stage, but the in, the meetings, the interviews, the mm. when, you're, when you're writing an article for a blog that you don't even want to do, let them see all that stuff so that they can understand what you're doing and value it and appreciate it, even if they don't end up in music. Right. You know, because we are all, every single musician is an entrepreneur. You know what I mean? I don't care what you do, who you work with, who's you're signed to, you run, you're an entrepreneur. You have to run your own ship. You know what I mean? Um, and they, it's, it's, it's beneficial for them to see that and understand that. You know what I mean? So that's, and I have a wife that allows me to do that. You know what I mean? She could be doing anything else in the world, right? Uh, she's super talented and she chose to waste her talents on my career, right? So, <laughs> so um, full circle, man, like, you know, that's how I feel like with, with with a lot of things in our life. My albums, We Made It Through the Wreckage was about the past, coming out of trauma, coming out of like crazy experiences. Then we went to In Our Time, which is about the present, us figuring it out, getting getting there, stabilizing our lives. And Prospect is about the future, mm. you know, choosing your destiny and saying, I know my purpose, I know my calling, let's go, let's get it, right? Um, and without her, that there's none of that. So she, and she's at the she's at the center of every one of my records in a weird way, because she's like my best friend, and everything. So it's 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 all real, right? You released a you released a thing and uh, you released a record or a collection of songs called Unarchived in 2021. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a version of your song Straight Ahead. I think it's like a piano stripped right. down version that I think is really beautiful. But I think it has like that message that ties all the records together. Just like, you know, trust your heart. Don't look back. No regrets. Travel light. All you need is your intuition, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Because like our intuition is what led us to be artists, right? right. We believe right. that we had a story that was important to tell. 
right? And maybe right. that's egocentric, right? And maybe that's like me saying like, hey, you know, there's a lot of people who've created songs and, you know, told stories, but like, you should listen to my story. Right, right, right. <laughs> Which is like, sometimes I wrestle with that. Like, why would anyone care about my love song? Right. But it feels good to me. And I want to like share that joy, right? Right, right, right. Like sometimes I don't know where it comes from, right? My wife uh, is also amazingly supportive, but she is sort of the instant gut check of <laughs> that song sounds like a Motown hit from 1968. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like right. we both have this like encyclopedic knowledge of like every other sounding song that kind of okay. we're ripping off, right? Right, right, right? But I'm like, yeah, but that song is awesome, right? Right, right. Uh, like, <laughs> Like that Smokey Robinson song spread a lot of joy. Like maybe I'm going to take a little bit of that, of that joy, yeah, stardust yeah. and like make it my own. Right. If it's not like totally a ripoff, does it count? <laughs> it's virtually impossible. Well, homage, right. <laughs> I mean, it, it, can, it, can you create something that has never been, that's absolutely unique? Right. You only know so many chords. Yeah. Like, it's just like, it's, it's almost impossible. Um <laughs> Yeah, it's it is a bit egocentric. I think we, I think we are egocentric a little bit, but egocentric is not always a bad thing if you root your ego in something good. You know what I mean? Like yeah. like like I don't know. Ego has has you know ego some Freud Freud made up. Um, uh, we don't know if it's real or not, but it's, it's something he said, and it turned into a negative thing, and then Beyonce turned it into a masculine, t you know, masculine. <laughs> What's that song? Got a big ego, right? So it became yeah. a masculine thing, and now it's like a. A toxic masculine thing but I, I feel like ego's okay if, if you keep it in check you know what i mean and just believing in yourself is, is okay if you keep it in check and then it can be negative if it's all about you like i don't want to bring up just a pop, uh current issue but like it felt like travis scott he's in this situation because of ego like ego could have led him down that path and yeah. it's like now you can't control it like it, it got too big right uh, maybe Kanye West is is where he is because his ego was tamed or humbled or like he he still has the ego but like something brought him low, brought him down, and he had to reach re rethink his life, right? And the way he he's still crazy, like like wow, but it seems like he's trying to show more compassion to the world. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. um, but I don't think ego is like the bad guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that we are the 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 we bring joy into the world. We bring reflection into the world. We're the new philosophers in a way, you know, like yeah. how many people are just out here reading philosophical books? Like we write it in our music. We write these feelings and these thoughts and these emotions. Like look at Jason Isbell. I don't know if you're a fan of Jason Isbell, but like how profoundly deep he goes with these songs. Like there's there's nothing, I don't think I've read anything more profound than some of his songs. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, and that's just human interaction, human experience. But uh, yeah, man, like, I don't. I don't think that. I, my, people think I'm so. A lot of people who who meet me think I'm the most humble person in the world, but if you ask my siblings, they think I'm egocentric because we're artists. <laughs> you know, because we're artists. Just simply because you have to believe in yourself, or else you'll get destroyed in this industry. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, all right. If you could have dinner with one person from history, dead or alive, Dave Chappelle. Ooh, dead or alive? Dead or alive. <sighs> So like <laughs> the pop culture answer me will say Dave Chappelle. Okay. The the religious answer would say uh, the, uh, I'll give you three answers. Can I give you three answers? Great. Pop culture is Dave Chappelle. Like as the social black, I think Martin Luther King would be great, right? Okay. And then like on the religious side, I would think like Jesus. Like that's that's like not the whole point. The Last Supper. Like that's that's. <laughs> All right. Let's say you could go out to dinner with Jesus, Dave Chappelle, and. <laughs> <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. Where in Toronto would you go to eat? Oh my gosh, I don't go to a lot of restaurants. I'm a vegan, so they'd all hate me. Um, <laughs> honestly, this is gonna be a cop out answer, but I'd have to cook for them, man. Like I'd have to be like, right. I'm cooking for y'all. Like, you know, I'm, I'm making food. Like, what's your but, signature dish? Mexican, man. Some Mexican, like, like, like salsa, like tossed up vet like peppers and stuff like and some very hot spicy stuff um 
I like nacho platters like crazy. Like I don't know, like just something some communal that we could all eat. You know what I mean? Right. Like a big giant nacho platter we could all just pull off and eat from. That would be kind of cool. Imagine just sharing nachos with like Dave Chappelle and Jesus. Like, come on. Right. I mean, they should film that and put it on <laughs> HBO Max. Is that a lame <laughs> answer? Dave Chappelle, Martin Luther King, and Jesus. No, I think I, I need. I, I think I need that. to have a female at that dinner table. Mahalia yeah. Jackson. We'll throw Mahalia Jackson in there. Great. All right. Last question. If you could play any venue in the world, Ooh. where would it be? And who would you play with on that stage? Any artist through history? All right. Musically, I'd have to bring Bob Marley back. All right. Um, and. I, I want to say that I may have played some, like I've already, it's crazy to say, I had a, you know, I played Radio City Music Hall, which is awesome, Red Rock. There has to be something in the UK that like is um, like the, the what's that theater called? Like I'm, I'm thinking the Princess Margaret Hospital, but it's not that. It's like the, is there like a Princess Margaret Theater or something like that? There's some Princess something theater in the UK that's like, let me, let me Google search it quickly. And I, I like, Um, but yeah, that's a hard one, man. Red Rocks was incredible. Princess, Princess Albert Theater, something like that, right? Yeah. Prince Albert Theater, something like that. You know. Let me see. I'm, right, I'm, I'm let's say one. let's say you get to curate a night at Red Rocks. You, Bob Marley, Tupac, Michael Ooh. Jackson. Okay. Yeah, it's the it's the. Where is it? Grand Opera House is amazing. Like, there's it's, the UK has some amazing venues. That's why I would go somewhere in the UK. Um, but I just can't think of the name of the venue. Tupac, Michael Jackson. Which era of Michael Jackson? I, I, you know, a bad era. Like, it's just like history has some great stuff too. Like, obviously, Thriller and Off the Wall. Like, Off the Wall is incredible. But like, I feel like the Michael Jackson that came later was addressing some like he has to sing earth song like huh. michael ja like if i'm in the audience michael jackson has to sing earth song like he like so everything like from bad after and not everything like not the garbage stuff because there's a lot of bad not good music that michael jackson put yeah. out later like invincible album wasn't the greatest um but history has some hits on it remember the time the song called who is it that i love but then, like, Man in the Mirror is one of the greatest songs ever. Somebody said to me the other day they think that song was cheesy, right? They were like, like I, they're like, I know I'm going to make you mad right now, but I don't like Michael Jackson. I was like, he, Royal Albert Hall. That's it. Yeah. Sorry, I was wrong about that. Royal Albert Hall. Well, I think um, there is a situation right now, and again, this is another disconnect between the generations of the man and the art separating of right. uh, bad behavior um, from the artist, right? right? How do we do that? Woody Allen, Michael Jackson, right? These songs that you hear still, of Michael Jackson, that they're just part of the universe, right? Am I not like, allowed to say Michael Jackson anymore? I, I still love Michael Jackson. No, of course Jackson. you are. <laughs> okay. but like, exactly. Right, because especially, I think, in the Black community, it's like, this was like the top right this is the, the most important earth-shaking artist of our time and so it's hard to then be like well we know the bad shit that he did right, right. r kelly you know it's like these people that were just part of everyone's lives for right, a right. decade and or more you know and then don't listen to them don't talk about them but there has to be some reckoning right where it's like well how do we punish someone that's not even on earth anymore right anymore. it's like he's, right. he's dead michael jackson's dead we can't like punish him more but the, the biggest thing do we, we have, do the, the other part of things that people don't acknowledge is that the amount of people who worked on those that music you know what i mean like right the mixing engineers um Sweden, his name is the like one of the greatest mixing engineers of all time. Yeah, Quincy Jones, like you know, there's just so many musicians on there. You know, like the songwriters, he like he didn't write all his own songs. You know what I mean? Right. Um. So, so I still, you know, I, I that's 
the Michael Jackson situation is like, it, it, I think he's still presumed innocent. Like, is that the final verdict still? Like, I, I think you know, the, no. the doc, you, you see, I don't, you, I, don't, you, I don't think he's presumed innocent anymore. I, well, they, they threw out that the, documentary. Did you I watch the documentary? Watch I felt like the documentary was like a, I couldn't watch it, man. I, uh, I remember I was on tour when, when that documentary came out. We had a, a huge debate about it. It's pretty bad. I mean, but those guys, their case were dismissed recently. Like they, yeah, the justice system. So, you so, know, so you're, you're, you're of the opinion that Michael Jackson did it, did all that creepy shit. Oh yeah. But I think that he also <laughs> had his own trauma, right? Like he also had right, right, a right. lot of really bad shit that he went through, right? He never got to be a kid, right? He never got to grow up in any sort of safe environment, but these people who then were very, you know, hurt by him. It's like, right. that's a real thing. Right. right, you know, um, yes, we'll never know the full extent the of it. Sure. What is going yeah. on? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, I didn't watch the documentary. I couldn't watch. It. I felt like it was just like planning things in your head. Um, and it, it's a it, Michael Jackson has some great songs. I think he, in terms of the humanity part of it, that's I think his position, like the way he sang about humanity, especially on a song like Earth Song. I don't know if, like you're from, yeah. yeah, like that song. You can't get more like connected to like the earth and the world and like humanity than that you know what i mean and the way he's right. saying like i always ask myself that's why you know i have a hard time believing some of this stuff because i'm like where do you draw that from if you're an evil person because if you're doing that stuff to me you're evil right so where do you draw that that but that's the difficult thing right some right. of the most amazing art that has some of the most amazing art that's ever been created <laughs> It's been created by very <laughs> troubled, <laughs> mentally unstable people. That's this, right. I think, terrible thing about great art at times is that right, right. a fractured mind you creates it. amazing art, right? right? And like and we almost want our artists to be broken people so that we can like live inside that right. trauma so we don't right. have to, right? Right, right, right. And I think maybe it's just it, it feels more artistic because we're so normalized. Like everybody in the world is just like we follow these conventions, and like when someone just breaks from that, it, it looks it's yeah. awe inspiring, right? Um, yeah, the Michael Jackson was crazy, but um, I thought more people were like on his side. I thought more people were like uh, <laughs> I thought you know because I still say it every time people ask me. And I haven't changed my my mind on what I think about Michael Jackson. Um, well, I think it's the, hard. I think it's hard when you are so moved by someone's art to right, right. again, like write them off. I think like my parents who fell in love watching Woody Allen movies are like, it's, they can't. It's right. hard for them to be like, no, I can't not watch Manhattan and Annie Hall. These movies that were part of our history. Yeah, and and I'm like, like oh, oh, I'm like, burn him alive. Right? Yeah, because I don't know any Woody Allen movies. So I'm like, he did it, burn him alive. He's, he's, oh. But again, <laughs> if you watch the documentary, <laughs> I watch a lot of documentaries. You're like, this dude is crazy town borderline evil, right? Uh, Michael. No, Woody Allen. But oh, Woody Allen. Like, oh, so there's a documentary on his situation too? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The only reason why I know about the Woody Allen was because of most deaf. He had a lyric in the song. Um, uh, I won't say the title of the song, Mr. N Word. And he talks about Woody Allen molesting his stepdaughter. Is that what, what he did? He literally, or yeah, she was like 13. He's taking like nude pictures of her and then they like get married. I mean, it's just freaking weird, right? Why does he get off scot free? Well, he kind of hasn't now, but like okay. it's taken a long time, right? right because right, people right. love his work. And to be fair, his work is amazing, you know? So it's a really hard you know, line to walk. Right? So do you ever listen to the opposing position on Michael Jackson's situation? Of course. Yeah. I mean, like, like, like the credibility of the, the, what's the name? Robeson or something? Or what's the guy's name? How he was like in the industry and he was kind of like a scam artist in the industry, he worked for like Britney Spears and he was kind of like not trusted in a lot of circles and kind of. Yeah. But it wasn't just him. There's been multiple accounts, right? Accounts it's like, that. It's just like two. It's because there's when there's smoke, there's fire. There's usually right. Same thing with Woody Allen. It's like every young teenage actress on his set. It was like he was literally begging them to fuck him. You know, That's it's funny. like, dude, she's like sixteen. You right. know, and you're like, yeah, but his movies are so great. You know, 
we're probably yeah. going to cut all of this anyway. But like, yeah, I, yeah. Think that, <laughs> I think that, I think the important thing is that like art is complicated, created uh, by yes. complicated people. Right, right. 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 And I, yeah, I mean, I deal, I'm dealing with trauma to myself. Like, you know, things that I like, even the song, the song itself prospect, like looking at what I, one thing I try to do is, is distill that trauma and distill those those moments because there's some of my songs are dark if you go into them you know what i mean there's a moment where it's like oh is this this is going to be dark and what i where i try to lead people is to this place of hope yeah because i don't like keeping myself in despair and keeping myself in hopelessness because i'm not the type of personality that can cope like that i'm the type of, like when i get down i get really down you know what i mean like yeah um, when i get just like one thing this pandemic taught me, like when certain some, certain things used to bother me, maybe something me and my wife had a, a we don't have arguments, but like something will happen or she does something right. that was like, I'm not happy with that for whatever reason. I'll shut off. Like, and I'll go in my studio and just like close off for long periods of time. And I had to like face that during the pandemic because it got to a point where it was like, you can't do this anymore. And that comes from like childhood traumas. But I, I feel like the art it's born from that because we all we often sedate those things and we're also we're just too busy most people like we don't live regular lives you know what i mean like we right. we we create our own schedule what's a weekend what oh you have the weekend off I, I don't understand what that means right yeah uh, we work on the weekends a lot of the times but uh most people are ignoring those things inside of us so music does two things it helps you escape it helps you confront mm -hmm. or it helps you walk through something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Those three things. I said two, but three. Um, if music just made you feel stagnant, you wouldn't listen to it. It has to arouse some kind of thing in you. Mm -hmm. So let's party. Let's dance. Let's have fun. Like it's 1999. You know, um, I can't feel my face, but I love it. That's escapism, all that stuff. You yeah. know what I mean? Then there's the, the heartfelt songs where it's just like, you're, you're, you're helping me confront an issue. You know, he's not heavy. He's my brother. That's confrontation. You know what I mean? And there's lean on me. Let's walk through this together, right? So music has to arouse you. And I think people that are not looking at the world from conventional lenses are going to be yeah. more likely to arouse those things in us. Um, because otherwise, it's just going to be the same stuff we hear all the time, right? Uh, are you going to, are you able to play a song for us to take us out? You got to repeat that. I just lost my headphones. Sorry. Oh. Are you able to play a song for us to take us out? Yeah, I'm going to play, um, I guess we spoke about my wife a lot on this one. So I'm going to do uh, Until You. It's uh, it's kind of refers to my backpacking days. And after those days, I met my wife and my life changed. So this is, uh, this one's all Until You, right? Let me get this. All right. Everything I've lost is all I've got. There ain't much I can give, but I'll give you everything. Anything you have, you gave me hell. Yeah. When I was living with nothing. Help me believe in something Didn't know what it goes on on the outside Every day is when it's about time I find words to keep me warm I was one of the wandering Trying to fight through the elements Time stood still when you first walked in Fate made plans I could never predict I was empty, lost without a clue Until now, until you Never went to bed, mm, still you lent your head yeah. Found this street pitiless, you reached out and crowned me king Didn't know what it goes along on the outside Every day is when it's about time I find war to keep me warm. I was one of the wandering, trying to fight through the elements. Time stood still in the 
just walked in They made plans I could never predict I was empty, lost without a clue Until now Until you Until you came alone Didn't know what it goes alone on the outside Every day is a witness, it's about time I find work to keep me warm I was one of the wandering Trying to fight through the elements Time stood still when you first walked in Fate made plans I could never predict I was empty, lost without a clue Until now, until you Everything I've lost is all I've got yeah. There ain't no tracking in But I'll give you breathing <laughs> dude such a beautiful song thanks for sharing that i appreciate it man great conversation yeah man well uh i'm sure we'll pass through the same places yes, eventually yeah. where are you located la LA. oh great awesome yeah, yeah i saw you have a show here in uh, was it march at the uh moroccan lounge yeah let me know yeah. if you want to come out i'll put you on the guest list yeah, here for sure absolutely all right last thing i have to ask you because as a a collector of hats myself. <laughs> it's a very specific hat that you've made your own, right? Yes, yes, yes. Because the fir first time I saw a picture of you, I was like, oh, that's cool. Like a, a horse jockey is now like <laughs> also doing music. That's that's rad. Like, does he also like like in the Kentucky Derby and then he's like playing shows? Like, what a cool story. <laughs> right, no, no, no. This is a, it's an equestrian hat, a medalist. Yeah. They call it a medalist hat. Um, in the UK for um, styling, and it, it's a uh, there's a there's an actual story I tell at my shows, but the thing is I can never tell it in media because once I tell it, it's it, I ruin the punchline, yeah, right? Yeah. So what I will say is that it's 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 my uniform, and I I wanted to find a way to not ever have to think about what I wear, yeah. <laughs> right? And uh, there's, 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 so there's a really funny story, but I can only tell that at my show. So I apologize to your audience for leaving. Rock and Lounge in March. Come Rock on and down, in March. Yeah, come on out. It's a, uh, but it is a, it is actually. If you can, let me see if you hear that. Yeah, you know, if someone <laughs> yeah. throws something at you, it's like you're fine. You know, yeah, like if I have a Michael Jackson fall on one day, you know, Coca Coca Cola <laughs> fall, then I'm, I'm prepared, right? So, <laughs> didn't the dude from uh, Outcast have a hat like that? Hey, yeah, he did have a hat like that. Yeah, yeah. His was the, so his was the jockey hat. I know this is weird, but his was like a jockey hat. So the jockey yeah. hats are a little bit longer, yeah. right? Um, and he wore the whole jockey outfit. And I'm not like, you know, it might look like I'm wearing a jockey outfit. But it, it was, it was a, it's a funny story that it involves me ordering a hat online and getting this hat instead. So it's a, it's a very yeah, uh, accident. fantastical story. I like it, man. Yeah, I, I can't right, man. So I go Keep for up it, the good work, man. We'll uh, you, yeah, brother. we'll definitely try to connect when you're when you're here in LA. Yeah, absolutely, bro. I appreciate it, man. And yo, keep keep grinding, keep doing anything I know, and, and congratulations on the baby. Hey, do you know if it's a boy or a girl? Did you say it's a girl? We're gonna be surprised. So you're surprising yourself. Yeah. So only yellow outfits you're gonna get from everybody. Everybody's gonna give you yellow, yellow and green. You know, people just send you whatever they want to send you anyway. So. That's you know. awesome. All right, man. Congratulations on that, man. I hope, hopefully, a, a, a healthy uh, birth and everything goes great for you, man. For sure. Awesome. Can you send me when you have uh, as soon as you can? Uh, because I actually want to try to get this out on Thursday. Okay, awesome. Everything shut down. Um, Are we officially done? I could stop the audio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, show on the road pod at Gmail is the best email to send it to. You if you can. Sure. Um, and that my manager would have that already, right? Or no? Yes. Okay, yes. So yeah, I'll just, I'll just, my wife. I'm calling her my manager. But yeah, yeah, I will. Um, so it'll be a Dropbox link. I don't know how big the file is gonna. Look. It shouldn't be that big, but I, I'll just give. She'll send you a Dropbox link where you can download. Right. 
And um, uh, do you do you want me to treat it a little bit? Like I'm, I'm using Adobe Audition, so I could add like a podcast effect to it, so it's kind of a little more master. Uh, if you want, I mean, I'm gonna I'll mix it too. But yeah, just um, yeah, just send it send it whenever you can. That, right, that would, the sooner the better. Okay, I'll do I'll do that like right now, so it's, it shouldn't. Take Thank me you so much. Time. All right, bro. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for having a great one. All right. You too. Peace.